When it comes to COVID vaccinations, Germany stands accused of buying up extra doses, while other EU countries simply aren't taking all of the doses that they're allowed. So what is going on with a plan that is supposed to be even-handed and run by the European Union? This is Roundtable. Hello for me, David Foster. Is the financial muscle of Germany at play here as the country is said to be looking after its own interests at the expense of others? Tensions are growing over whether the EU Commission has secured enough vaccines for the bloc. Member states agreed to hand responsibility for ordering vaccines to Brussels. But Germany has been criticised for securing 75 million extra doses for itself. A German health ministry spokesman confirmed that the doses will not be delivered until the others have been rolled out across the EU. It's a move that has been met with strong opposition, with members of the European Parliament calling it pure vaccine nationalism, selfish behaviour and a total lack of solidarity. Cyprus has taken things into its own hands and is asking Israel for vaccines amid EU delays. There are concerns that other countries, worried about possible shortages, will explore options elsewhere. So has the European Union got its vaccine tactics wrong? And was it a good idea to give the job to Brussels? Well, I'm delighted to say that we can welcome to the round table today uh, from Brussels, Jakob Funk Kierkegaard, senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund. We go to The Hague in Holland and uh, welcome Louise van Schaik, head of Unit EU and Global Affairs at Clinkendale. And then to Dubai, Fred Cyrus Röder is there, health economist and managing director of Consumer Choice Centre. We're going to kick this idea around amongst the three of you, but Jakob, you first. Is Germany being greedy or simply sensible? I mean, I think Germany is acting, uh, reflecting its both its role as an EU, but also a national uh, country that's heading into a super election year. It's obvious that uh, the, the outcome of that election will be very keenly uh, related to the uh, government performance with regards to the vaccine rollout. Uh, but having said that, no, I mean, I think the vast majority of vaccines that are coming to Germany and will continue to come to Germany uh, will be purchased through the EU procurement agreement. But that there is at least talk about uh, doing something at the national level to sort of signal a degree of government actions being taken is not surprising, but it's also not particularly, uh, you know, threat threat. Because the main thing to me is that the EU procurement process ensures that, uh, you know, in a matter of a few weeks, uh, enough vaccines will go to every member of the EU. I want to ask you all in just a moment why some countries are, are not taking up the number of vaccines that they've been offered. But uh, Freda, as a German, what do you make of the actions of your country? I, it, it's easy, of course, to blame the European Union uh, as a German. It sounds especially less like vaccine nationalism if the head of the commission is a German doctor. Um, and definitely the EU procurement system seems to be an experiment. We might have tried with something less important, such as the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Um, but it's not just the EU failing on, on the um vaccine procurement, it's also Germany administering the vaccine very slowly. I think the latest figures show that only 1.2% of Germans have at least received one jab of the vaccine. That's the EU average. Uh, the EU members such as Denmark or Malta, which are, uh, have twice as many uh, patients already covered. And then just recently departed United Kingdom is around 6%. And well, I tell you what, Dubai, since, since you're running just, through them, let's let's bring them up on screen yes. at this particular moment. Yeah, the UK is leading uh, right now. 6.3% of the population, that's uh, more than 4 million doses. Uh, next in line in terms of doses per 100 of the population, in other words, a percent, 2.8% Denmark, Italy, 1.86. And Germany, as you say, uh, way down there, one percent 
0.25, with only slightly more than a million doses administered. We'll talk about the slowness of the process in just a moment. And then France, well, it's been very, very slow indeed, trying to convince the population to take it. Just 422,000 doses. And the EU as a whole, 5.2 million, compared to the UK, 4.3 million. Uh, the EU, 1.17. Uh, it's pretty slow, isn't it? So we've got to talk about the rollout across the European Union. Why is Germany, and I'll come to you, Louise, in just a moment, if I may, because uh, Holland's been pretty slow as well. Why is Germany so slow in getting it out to its people? I mean, we have our governments have now 10 months to be prepared for the vaccine rollout because from early spring on last year, everyone was hoping for a vaccine and vaccines started to be developed. But now there's like confusion between the German states and the federal government and everyone tries to blame the European Union. And we can totally see that other countries like Israel, which is close to 30 percent coverage, or the United Arab Emirates, close to 20 percent, were able to do this. So it seems to be that there's massive incompetence. Uh, when it comes to rolling out the vaccine, Germany was praised throughout 2020 as a country that masters COVID-19 fairly well. And it seems that many politicians were just cozy with that international praise and did actually not brace for the actual execution of mass vaccinating 82 million citizens. Uh, Louise, I will ask you about your country, uh, Holland, the Netherlands, in just a moment. But what, what do you make of what Germany's doing. Uh, we heard Jakob saying it was perhaps electioneering to some extent, making yeah. sure that it got uh, the people it wanted on, on site. But does greed come into this? It's pocketing doses that could go elsewhere. Yeah, I think it, that's that's also an aspect. I mean, there is clearly this political dimension and the German Bundesländer not being happy with the German federal government and then blaming, you know, Brussels for it. Uh, there's also the fact that Germany is a very big state. I mean, a, a smaller EU member state for a smaller member, mem member state would not have been so easy. And they also did it in a period in September, allegedly they made these additional deals. They, they did this in a period when uh, they were ha having the EU presidency. So they were having their m mouth full of also the international support mechanism. When Germany now buys more, there is less available for the rest of the world, even though they can share it later on, doing it in a way vaccine diplomacy, like the Chinese and the Russians are trying to do. So, um, yeah, it is indeed a bit unfortunate. And it's also unfortunate because now uh, the Commission cannot tell other EU member states, uh, like Hungary, that they should... Uh, not buy outside of the EU advanced purchasing well, scheme. Well, I've heard a suggestion that um, Hungary may well go and buy uh, from Russia as yet unfounded. But I wanted to ask you, Louise, you first of all, and then we'll go back to Jakob on this one. Countries such as Bulgaria, uh, Poland, Greece, uh, Portugal, four countries that I've read of, have not taken up all of the doses that they would be allowed to um, had they wanted to, where are they going? Where are those doses going? Are they the ones that are being sold to Germany? Apparently, uh, on top of the extra deals that Germany has secured, they're also, and France also, is, are also buying up vaccines which are not bought by other member states, which they were entitled to. And apparently, the reason why member states don't buy all the vaccines they were entitled to is because of the... Uh, the logistics of the Pfizer, Pfizer uh, vaccine, eh? because you have to share it in such a cold temperature, you have to save it in such cold temperatures. Uh, it, 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 it requires an extra uh, logistical operation, and apparently not all EU member states were prepared for that. And also overall, I, I guess uh, a lot of member states had gambled, let's say, not the Pfizer vaccine to become the earliest available, but other uh, vaccines, which are perhaps easier in distribution and rollout. So, Louise, it's not necessarily that they don't want to have the vaccine in their country. It's just they're waiting for something that uh, might be easier to use. Yeah, so it seems uh, it's cheaper, it's easier to distribute, easier to get to the people, less risk of, of spilling vaccine. Um, so that seems to be among the reasons. Uh, and frankly, I think many EU member states have gambled wrongly that other vaccines would be available earlier. Uh, and now we only have the Pfizer and the Moderna, hopefully soon the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. Um, and that one is also way cheaper. Okay. Jacob, are we right to think of this 
as being too bureaucratic. The reason that it's taking so long uh, to roll out the vaccinations is because each country is being allowed to make its own choices. And yet the decision on what to buy is being made by the, the centralized body. It's too unwieldy, perhaps. No, I don't actually think that's an appropriate description because when these decisions about what to buy and these negotiations took place, which was, you know, in the late summer, uh, we didn't know which uh, vaccine would uh, come first. Uh, in fact, all we had to go on was that the Moderna and Pfizer uh, are basically uh, turned out to be the first ones, but they also at the time they had an entirely new uh, technology untested. Uh, so not betting on them at the time was entirely rational. Uh, and with regard to the distribution, I mean, look, the EU doesn't have any jurisdictions over uh, EU member states' healthcare systems. Uh, the entire uh, actual logistical operation of getting people vaccinated, that is a, an exclusive member state responsibility. Uh, so to the extent that member states have prioritized that, they have been competent at it, uh, we're seeing the results. Uh, and uh, I think Louise is right that there might be some who are gambling uh, with regards to waiting, uh, you know, a month or two to get access to cheaper vaccines. But we actually don't know whether these cheaper vaccines will be approved. We don't know if they are as effective as the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines appears to be. Uh, and of course, the longer you wait, the longer you're going to have to have uh, government, sorry, the economies in, in uh, various stages yeah, of lockdowns. Sure. So, so sorry to interrupt, bad, but there's something I'd like deal. to clear up here. I'd like to clear up something here. Um, the European Union has said it is the European Medicines Association has said that it is taking its time with approving other vaccines because it wants to be absolutely 100 percent certain that they work, that they are not dangerous. But is it being perhaps too cautious, Jakob? Uh, no, I actually don't think so. Uh, I think we need to uh, be clear that uh, they're not only testing for what is in the vaccine, so to speak. You mean whether it works. Uh, a lot of the testing and why it takes a lot of time actually is in the testing of the production processes. Uh, and it has already been uh, emerged that actually uh, the EMA found, found out that the Pfizer uh, production uh, process was actually slightly faulty. So that uh, part of the reason that they waited was that they forced Pfizer to change aspects of its production process to basically maintain the level of quality in the actual vaccines delivered. So you can always say, uh, you know, it's taking longer than it should. But uh, it's always a trade-off between speed and accuracy or certainty. Uh, and I don't necessarily think, therefore, that the EU, uh, the EMA has erred of being too conservative. Uh, I think they're being, if you like, prudent. Uh, whereas uh, r rushing into it, as was done in other countries that have clearly gotten a head start, uh, notably the UK, you know, there are downsides to that too. Let's talk about the law on this and potential embarrassment for the president of the European Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen. Um, she had this to say just a short while ago. We have all agreed legally binding that there will be no parallel negotiations, no parallel um, contracts. So the framework we are all working in is a framework of 27. Together we are negotiating, together we are procuring, and together we are bringing forward this vaccination process. So, Fred, let me come to you. She talks about the law in this. Is what Germany is doing perhaps illegal? I'm not an EU lawyer, but we definitely see a global health crisis. And... Um, any way a national government is able to procure more medicine is definitely legit, even if it might not be legal. And Germany is not the only member state that is trying to procure extra doses of uh, different vaccines. Um, so that should not be or probably will not have any legal aftermath because several member states have already gone that way. Um, what we should probably also think about because uh, vaccine approvals have just been discussed. I mean, why do European EU citizens need to wait 
for the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, to approve something if the US FDA or the British authorities have already deemed a vaccine to be safe. We're just losing time, which means people are dying and our economies keep shrinking and we keep spending billions on uh, furloughing schemes. So, well, yeah, Jakob, five... Jakob has given his opinion on that. He thinks it's right to be cautious. Um, Louise, do you want to come back with what we've just heard from Fred? Yeah, I think one of the differences is also that in the UK and the US, they did preliminary approvals where the liability issues with the taxpayers. And when you have an EMA approval, it means that the liability is with the producers. And this is also how the advanced purchase agreements of the EU with the manufacturers have been established, which may be more bureaucratic <laughs> for the producers because they have to think about their own liability uh, with regard to the vaccine. So I think that's also a big change why the things speed up a bit slower in the, are, are set in motion a bit slower in the EU uh, than, for instance, in Israel or in the UK. Um, but in the, in the end of the day, of course, time will prove if we need it, let's say, this liability or not. Um, uh, so, yeah, in general, the EU has taken a more cautious approach. It's also slower. And there is now, of course, pressure because of yeah, the more um, uh, infectious uh, variants of the virus going around and the pressure being up to speed up the, yeah. uh, the vaccination. But and now we also have the issue of the production scale, you know, can it be produced quicker? And there's, Where there's another element produced? to this. It, it, mm -hmm. it's, it is why are Europeans perhaps slightly loath to take up uh, the vaccine? We've, we've seen that chart, but there was an article today in which the EMA, the European Medicines Association, was quoted saying its system had been hacked at some point and misinformation had been put out there to the public talking about how dangerous these vaccines were or are. That was the allegation. Anyway, so back to you, Fred, sorry, I, I threw part of your point to Louise, but I want to come back to you. What, what do you make of what the EMA has said about this? Could that be one reason why people are loath or slow at least to take it up? I mean, I would agree with the EMA that there is a vaccine hesitancy. And you can see, I believe it is Th Thailand and the United Kingdom, where the most, the largest pro proportion of population is eager to get a vaccine. And then you see the debate in France where the government even admitted that they roll it out very slowly to build up trust in vaccines. This is definitely a huge problem in society that there is skepticism towards proven science. I mean, I would take the vaccine or one of the vaccines immediately when it's, once it's offered to me. Um, and obviously there are misinformation campaigns from conspiracy theorists um, that, that ride on this wave to um, basically make the population even more hesitant than they already are to get vaccinated. And it's it's up to the scientific community and society in general to build trust in these vaccines because they are they are proven to be safe. Jakob, what do you think of that, this this alleged hacking of the EMA? No, I mean, look, I think that uh, ultimately there are, you know, national histories that uh, proves that some in, I, in earlier, uh, you know, uh, pandemics, if you can call it that way, I mean, swine flu, etc., there were uh, uh, some side effects with the uh, vaccines there. So this doesn't come from any from nothing. Uh, I think that's very clear. And each country may or may have different uh, history histories there. But it doesn't change the fact that this is not a normal Sort of situation. This is a pandemic, and there is an urgent national, economic, and political and health interest in getting as many people vaccinated as possible. Uh, but but so, therefore, why? Uh, that, why? Sorry, I'm going to butt in here. Why, therefore, are people across Germany more loath than, as um, Fred has just said, in the UK and in Thailand to get the vaccination? Are they being fed misinformation, or are they not being encouraged necessarily by their national governments to do so? No, I, I think it's predominantly the, the latter. I mean, vaccine skepticism in these countries, uh, Germany, France, etc., is not a new thing. It goes back a number of years. Uh, it is undoubtedly being amplified by, uh, you know, misinformation, uh, as, as Fred said, conspiracy theories, etc. But this is not uh, uh, something new. We have seen it uh, with other types of vaccination drives. Um, but uh, so what needs to be done is, in my opinion, that the government needs to be much more proactive. And there should also be, if you like, sanctions associated with not uh, taking a vaccine. 
Uh, it is but that, that almost opinion. sounds like you're making it compulsory for people to have the vaccine. No, no, I don't, making, no, I don't. You know, think if you're thinking uh, of imposing was, sanctions against people, that no, is a I'm punishment not, uh, well, for not getting it them is, yeah, to have I the vaccine. Think the other, no, I think the opposite way to think about it is you need to have a carrot to take it if it's an issue. Uh, and, you know, the idea of a vaccine, you know, a vaccine car, you cannot board an airplane or other types of public transportation if you're not carrying that car. You cannot but go to a restaurant. the sanction is not a carrot, is it? Uh, it's that a kind stick. of thing. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but I mean, as I said, I think sanction is the wrong word. I think an incentive, if you like, uh, is that it yeah, should be okay. much easier to return to uh, your normal uh, way of life if you have taken the vaccine. Uh, I think that should be pretty clear. I also think there should be full transparency when it comes to public institutions, whether it's schools or elderly care homes about the share of the staff there that has taken the vaccine. Then people can see uh, how, quote unquote, safe uh, the environment into which their loved ones go is. Let's try and wrap this up by summing up some of the things we, we've heard. Uh, a lack of solidarity, perhaps, Louise, but one that might undermine the European Union to some extent, what we've seen from Germany. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I think it will indeed give uh, leeway to others and also should, let's say, the COVID vaccination not be a once-off thing, but should we turn out to be the case that we have to buy new vaccines every two years or so because they only last, you know, their, their, their effectiveness only lasts for a specific amount of time. We don't know yet exactly at this point. Uh, then it might be better always to do it as a block because then you're able to, 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 to negotiate a better deal simply because you're bigger. And if, you know, uh, Germany or other member states uh, divert from that common approach, this indeed undermines. And therefore, it's probably needed um, to work towards a bigger Europeanization of, of EU health policy. Um, so... Yeah. Currently, apparently, it's a kind of gentleman's agreement that we have, that we buy a purchase as a block in legal terms. But, but, but very difficult, need, isn't it? Of course, it's a more robust framework. Difficult to argue with the financial side of it. If you buy in bulk, you're going to get better prices. But then you have to take into account how difficult it is to enforce a federal system, if you like, whereby the EU has bought onto states, individual states that have their own systems and beliefs. Yeah, especially in my own country. I mean, my own country is one of the countries where health is considered really a national matter, a national concern. There was hardly any criticism here on the Brussels scheme because we criticized our own system and we didn't even realize that it was the EU that made the, the vaccine deals for us. Um, and yeah, the Netherlands is also lagging behind. Uh, um, uh, but that's because, yeah, we focus a lot on the national aspects that we have made our health system very lean and mean. We have a privatized health security system, and that's something that we're now, you know, confronted yes. with, if you like. There, there, uh, there are so many moving parts, and it's very difficult to impose a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, we're coming towards the end of the program. Uh, Fred, I just want to ask you about solidarity. When you have suggestions that Cyprus is going to buy vaccines from Israel, again, another member of the EU going outside the, the bloc's original initiative, what do you think the long-term effects might be? I hope that the long-term effects are that we actually look at the next pandemic we might face, that if we have centralized procurement in the EU, the main key success factor should not be to get the vaccines the cheapest, but get the, very quickly a large amount, because those countries that vaccinate faster and got more doses just pay twice as much as the EU. And these, these amounts are not so much if you look at the tens of billions we're spending on furloughing schemes. OK, quick one for you, Jakob, as we, as we come towards the end. A lot of criticism of the EU, criticism of Germany. Will the bloc come out of this being able to say we, we've actually done a good job? I mean, I think I think ultimately uh, it's not going to threaten the survival or cohesion of the EU, uh, and ultimately the uh, what will decide whether the success rate or the speed at which vaccinations uh, will be finished is going to be the capabilities of national governments. Uh, but I do think, as as Fred alluded to, uh, that what 
this indicates at the EU level is that you need to have put in place a functioning uh, procurement scheme so that this is not going to be a bottleneck in the you know next uh, pandemic, which is bound to hit at some point. Uh, yeah, so quick final question. Could it have learn. been avoided if they had the right system in place or was it impossible to predict anything that has resulted in what we now know? I mean, yeah, I don't think, I think it could have been. No. Actually, yes, Louise, very quickly, sorry. I think they worked after smallpox already on, a, on establishing a common system, and it was now also put to use. And also they purchased 2 billion uh, vaccines if all of them become available. So uh, the EU might have w might well have bought, have overbought. It's just that the ones that have bought have taken a higher price and uh, let the liability with the yeah. taxpayers have now earlier access to it. And of course, yeah. this is a question we haven't been able to address because we are now out of time. Um, if you're slow to roll out the vaccines and some of those vaccines have an expiry date, then you're not necessarily going to be able to use all of them because some will have to go into the bin and you'll have to get more from elsewhere, which leads us back to where we were with Germany at the very beginning. I'm sorry we haven't had more time for this. Um, thank you very much indeed to all three of you for taking part in, in this edition of Roundtable. Very good to have your thoughts and uh, we hope to see you again sometime. Wherever you are watching, this program from me, David Foster, my thanks, and we hope to have you with us on another occasion as well. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>